Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the class for Monday, the, what will the date be? 26th of February uh, 2024. And we're looking, of course, at gender and genre with a particular focus on the melodrama. The melodrama is going to be the genre that you're going to sample via watching Matt Sofal's uh, Letter from an Unknown Woman. Um, and the main article that this session is based on is Linda Williams's essay about low body, low body genres, what's called film bodies is the, is the title of the essay. But we'll also be looking at Steve Neal and his ideas around masculinity as spectacle. The next two slides are merely a recap. So I'm not going to kind of talk through these, but they cover, you know, the fact, to, the fact of why we're looking at gender still uh, in the module, because it was a huge issue for film theory in the 1970s and beyond. Um, and then there's, I've basically recapped by reinserting with a few edits, the, uh, the text from two weeks ago um, that introduced um, feminist thought and, and particularly the second wave of feminism, which was so influential on feminist film studies. You can read through um, these next two slides yourselves. They give you a few important names of people from feminism's second wave. Um, there's more details, more depth on this in the slides from week five, but some of you weren't here for that class. Um, so I kind of recommend that you go back and look at those slides anyway, of course. Um, but yeah, so the next slide after this won't have any narration and then we'll get started properly on slide number four. All right, so what is melodrama? And um, I'm going to start looking, building up to our looking closely at Linda Williams' 1991 piece now. We'll also, we, we will be considering how that revises or, or links itself to the kind of world of Laura Mulvey's visual pleasure and narrative cinema. It's 16 years later, she's not particularly directly critical of Mulvey, but she is from a different tradition and a different stage of feminist film theory. Um, I don't think Mulvey would have written in the way kind of accepting way that Williams writes about melodrama back in 1975 and feminist film theory was in a different place if you like by 1991 but we will touch on how Mulvey fits into this new um you know this new sort of drive towards the kind of thing that Williams was talking about um so some of you may have studied melodrama a little bit before you may have come across melodramas from the very beginning of the t of, of cinema's kind of time in American cinema's kind of narrative, American cinema's reign. Uh, melodramas made by people like D.W. Griffith, like Broken Blossoms or Orphans of the Storm is another one. Or I think I think you all did study Sunrise last year by F.W. Murnau, which is a 20th century Fox film of the late 1920s, just before uh, just before the coming of sound or kind of the year of the coming of sound. It's one of the last great silent American films. Sunrise can easily be um, described as a melodrama if if you're struggling to kind of picture the kind of thing. Um, also known as the woman's film, and this is something we need to address as well, or the weepy. That is not meant to be, or that association with women of the melodrama is not meant to be um, complementary to women and women's ways of spectating, as we'll get onto in the rest of this slide. Uh, also known as the weepy, something that brings out a bodily excess. Williams talks a lot about excess. Obviously, it's there in the title of the essay. And crying is a bodily excess. It's something that we're supposed to feel a little bit ashamed about. It shows us losing control. So melodrama films brought out, you know, notionally in only female audiences, because this is quite a sexist kind of way of looking at these films that was uh, extant in the film industry back then. It brought out tears and crying from female audiences. Melodrama is, in fact, a major classical genre. There's a lot of uh, debate about calling it a mode rather than a genre. Comedy is a mode. Um, arguably, you can say elements of melodrama can appear in any genre. And indeed, you could say that you can have other genres appear under the melodrama banner. So you could have a romantic melodrama, you can have a family melodrama. Um, but also, possibly, you can have an action melodrama, as the Western has been described. So you know, male driven genres are not immune to being touched by melodrama nor being thought of as melodramatic. Uh, so that kind of makes a little bit like comedy has its own forms, recognisable forms within it. 
like screwball comedy or parody uh, that have their own conventions that don't necessarily need a kind of headline set of conventions from a comedy genre but have their own therefore we see comedy or a lot of people see comedy as a mode melodrama is similar so the individual forms of melodrama that you can find like like a romantic melodrama uh, have their own conventions so it's a bit debatable as to whether it's a genre but that's not really our main business today what does usually feature in melodrama and help to identify melodrama is heightened and stylized drama combining artifice obviously from which comes the word artificial things like excessive plot contrivances a lot going on in plots if you've ever seen any of those dw griffith early uh, melodramas you'll know you'll know what i mean the kind of the kind of damsel in distress tied to the train tracks kind of thing a lot of plot contrivances and exaggeration but but combining this in what seems like a paradox with a certain realism that is visceral so visceral things are things that we feel very deeply we actually feel kind of bodily or emotionally melodramas tend to have a very vivid mode, mode of presentation um, they tend to be very dramatic they tend to be exaggerated and they tend to provoke intense emotions while also showing intense emotions on the screen experienced by characters so you have on the one hand the idea of something being very stylized and on the other hand some, something being in a way quite realistic but that realism being a visceral realism so being about something that uh, pulls a response from a viewer however there is most definitely a move away from realism um, in melodrama because it is defined by excess talked about tears just a minute ago as you know crying as a form of excess the root of the word um, melos is in melodrama melos is music so music plus drama is melodrama thomas elsasser a, a very noted writer on melodrama says a dramatic narrative or defines melodrama as a dramatic narrative in which musical accompaniment marks the emotional effects so the accompaniment marks the emotional effects the music is there to help us to recognize and to encode the emotions that we're meant to be that we're meant to be feeling and also the emotions that we're meant to be seeing or as linda williams puts it melodrama encompasses a range of films that are quote marked by lapses in realism so moving away from realism again marked by lapses in realism excesses of spectacle displays of primal and even and she puts infantile here in scare quotes even even feature infantile emotions and she puts infantile in scare quotes so she's being very careful there i'll come back to uh why she's being careful like that in a second it may be its association both with excess and its relevance to women and women taking pleasure from entertainment that makes melodrama a genre or a mode that subverts traditional male gaze dynamics so as i've said you know, movie will pop up from time to time um in the background to this lecture because williams is is writing post movie but melodrama is a genre that seems to subvert traditional male gaze dynamics it seems to be all about female pleasure which even hollywood you know film make, uh, film industry people producers recognized even if they did it in a very patronizing way by styling melodramas as women's films women's pictures and weepies um the idea of the excess connects to what williams calls infantile so i'm not letting those hollywood producers get off the hook there was an idea and we'll have a clip on this we'll have a clip on this in a second we'll actually revisit portrait of a woman on fire um which we also looked at in the week on movie it's been difficult for me because I'm, I'm recording this before we've had that week on movie but we should look at portrait of a woman on fire in the week on movie as well um lapses in realism excesses of spectacle and displays of infantile emotions infantile is in scare quotes it's the idea that women respond almost too strongly and in too out of control way to melodramas because they get too enraptured and too caught up in them think of the mia farrow character in purple rosa cairo which i showed you last semester and i've referred to that a few times now she goes to the cinema to escape from the, deg the degradation of her life so she goes and chooses a frothy comedy to cheer her up she doesn't go to a melodrama which might make her even sadder but she is the kind of female viewer dedicated almost e almost even obsessive that kind of hollywood producers and studios had in mind at this time and it happens to be a comedy in purple rosa cairo but the idea that the woman the the female viewer over invests in the emotions and can't control herself and ends up crying is something that is seen as infantile it's yet another kind of stick to beat the female um audience with 
here's a here's a genre for you in other words that you're going to enjoy but we're going to kind of call them weepies and dismiss them a little bit because you know you can't stay properly distanced watching them like a man can with a western well you know what i'm quite capable of crying at westerns and a lot of action films have hugely melodramatic aspects to them uh, i'm letting this slide run on far too long so i must move on but i'm noting the sexism there obviously of the connection of women feeling emotions in cinema with an infantile uh, activity i'm noting that sexism there okay so what does williams say about how how, how does she uh, uh, estimate the audience of melodrama she says the the classic the classic melodrama for which we can think you know very much the things done in hollywood films of the 30s and 40s and 50s and kind of and kind of really classically done by films by douglas sirk who i think you may be familiar with from film form and meaning uh, who made things like um all that heaven allows and magnificent obsession um these were films addressed to women in their traditional status under patriarchy so williams isn't arguing that this is the only way that women can be it's a status under patriarchy that's been sort of fixed around women um, addressed to women in their traditional status as wives, mothers, abandoned lovers, or in their traditional status as bodily hysteria or excess. Now that word excess is coming up again very importantly, isn't it? Um, we see there uh, women given only certain stations, you know, um, to be a wife, to be a mother, to be somebody who is waiting for another chance at a male romance, you know, somebody who's just been abandoned, um, presumably because they're not good enough or perhaps because they're too needy, not independent enough or uh, reckoned and kind of envisioned as bodily hysteria or excess so the person who cries too much the person who can't control themselves the person who um doesn't look at things rationally all these again all these kinds of sticks to beat women with that have been um conceptual sticks that have been used over the years you know women aren't as rational as men women can't think as coolly out of a problem as men women can't accept reality in a way all of these things followed through to the assumptions that were feeding um, the labelling of melodramas, you know, as distinguished as they were and as well made as they were and as much money as they were making for Hollywood producers, the labelling of melodramas as women's pictures or as weepies. They were all kind of informed by these sexist, sexist thoughts and associations of women uh, with un under patriarchy with being excessive or being hysterical. And thus the melodramas kind of reflect this by using figures like, for example, sick and afflicted women. There is a sick woman in today's film, Letter from an Unknown Woman, a woman who catches a disease. The woman who is suffering in some way, it can be suffering in love terms, it can be suffering in romance terms, it can be suffering in, uh, from loneliness, but it also can be suffering from, um, you know, that some melodramas can kind of touch on domestic abuse of people who, who live in um, bad relationships, but it can also be the woman who is uh, suffering because her path to love has not been smooth or the person she wants isn't available, unrequited love kind of thing. So melodrama, melodramas, uh, especially Hollywood melodramas, kind of use those figures to, to almost reflect back to what the expected, um, even if imagined, but the expected kind of status of the audience members are that they would be a wife or a mother and that they could be somebody who is looking for love or can't find love and, and feels sorry for themselves and therefore associates more and identifies more you know we talked about identification three or four weeks ago identifies more with the situation of the sick afflicted or suffering woman in the melodrama in the diegesis themselves it's the idea that the female audience members uh will see this afflicted woman and have room there to empathize and even connect their own situation to the situation of the characters i want to mention a major book on melodrama that's available in the library as an ebook where a lot of the great essays um about melodrama and particularly hollywood melodrama have been collected and that is the book from 1990 home is where the heart is edited by christine gledhill uh, please have a look at that if you're going to do any work on melodrama home is where the heart is edited by gledhill so this is an essay that looks at bodily responses to films. Thus, we can say it is in a very different tradition from what we looked at with apparatus theory three weeks ago, I think it was. And Mulvey can be placed within apparatus theory in, uh, in many respects. Um, apparatus theory, you'll remember, has nothing to do with bodily engagement of spectators. It's all based around that kind of, you know, Baudry, uh, as Baudry sort of puts it, that kind of Renaissance gaze 
um, that perfectly centered spectatorial gaze. It's all to do with mental uh, apparatus and gaze, isn't it? It's nothing to do with body and how bodies feel and how bodies kind of express themselves or are addressed by film. So it's very different. Uh, Williams, Williams' work is very different from that. She explores audiences addressed as bodies, basically, and through their bodies. The piece is gender motivated and politically motivated in a broader sense in that it looks at how values become attached to genres and how those values confirm or reject those um, those values out there in society, those ideologies in society. Uh, for instance, on the last couple of slides, when we talked about the dismissal of the weepy as being, you know, or the dismissal of melodramas as weepies, because they are they are connected with an improper emotional response or bodily response to an emotion by a female spectator you already have a value attached there don't you, you have a value that is looking down on women that is sexist uh, that is misogynist um so she's interested in how values become attached to genres uh, and how they therefore gain some kind of social life whether that's always a kind of a, a true reflection of the genre or whether it's a distorted one and she's not coming, you know, her aims in this essay kind of make it clear that she's not coming to these genres to sort of try and dismiss them. She looks at three main genres in the essay, horror, pornography and melodrama. And she is not coming to sort of um, criticise those, those, those three genres. Plenty of people have done that apart from her. She's trying to understand why they have been positioned in terms of the values that can become attached to them, why they've been framed in, in terms of the ways, ways they've been framed in previous spectator theory and kind of film theory and also sometimes in how the industry regards those genres. So she's looking for ways out of rigid views of fixed and passive and perhaps even infantile spectators. She's kind of saying why should a melodrama because it prompts tears in a woman because it a female spectator because it prompts that kind of version of excess why is that infantile? What is what is going on here that that is seen as infantile? What is at the root of that? She re-examines these three genres that are all thought to be conservative. Pornography probably thought to be the most conservative, all the most harmful in terms of doing sexist harm. But horror is, is usually thought of as being quite harmful as well in, in many ways, kind of culturally harmful or ideologically harmful and being, being distasteful to um, kind of progressive ideas and ideology. You know, horror can be quite challenging as well as pornography can to um, kind of progressive and, and liberal ideas. She's re-examining these genres that are thought of to be conservative or even oppressive to see if they can be used and marshalled against fixed categories of passive spectators to see if, you know, to try and understand what's going on here with the spectatorship of these three genres. And if something is being overlooked or if there's more than more than meets the eye or if actually we need to flip things around and stop thinking of them as, as sort of doing harm in a progressive sense. Now, obviously. The concept of excess is starting to become very important to this essay and come to the forefront. And Williams calls melodrama that which exceeds the normative system. The normative system um, that she means is the filmic system, the narrative system and kind of the, um, the value, you know, the kind of ideological system of traditional narrative cinema. Uh, she then says it would not be unquote it would not be unreasonable in fact to consider all three by which means the three genres she's dealing with in this essay porn horror and melodrama it wouldn't be unreasonable to consider all three under the extended rubric of melodrama so I was under under a melodrama umbrella considered as a filmic mode of stylistic and or emotional excess that stands in contrast to more dominant modes of realistic goal oriented narrative and she's put the scare quotes around dominant there to question that dominance to say that that is a constructed um, importance placed on more realistic goal oriented narratives. So to break that down a little, she's saying that something that all the three um, genres have in common uh, that is a trait of melodrama. So you can sort of find this kind of DNA of melodrama in all of them is that as filmic modes, they present stylistic excess that if you like, uh, connects to emotional excess, presents emotional excess in the narrative, but also prompts an emotional excess in viewers. And that is what is contrasting the dominant modes of the kind of narratives we were talking about really when we followed Nick Brown's uh, kind of uh, blueprint through Stagecoach, or that we talked about back in week one and two when we were looking at kind of you know basic traditional narratives before we started to look at things that were a little outside that in terms of point blank. So 
the kind of things that realistic goal oriented narratives are interested in um, a, a sort of pseudo or kind of quasi objective viewpoint the best the best position for the observer to watch you know the invisible guest um, idea that that is the spectatorial viewpoint of classical cinema and that of course matches up quite well with what Baudry has said about the sort of censored spectatorial gaze those kinds of things are not what melodrama is trying to achieve um, kind of balanced rational time and space balanced mise-en-scene and contents of frame and balanced story you know story that works along sort of classical um, classically kind of rational ways of organizing the stories in these in these kind of traditional classical films are not what melodrama does melodrama goes beyond that so it's a it, it, it includes this kind of excessive energy that goes beyond the the kind of more accepted the more um official mode of realistic goal-oriented narratives where characters behave in certain ways don't they in order to achieve those goals and you know we saw how Bordwell um said you know um 60% of all kind of classical narratives end in a happy ending. There's a kind of a formula. Melodrama breaks that formula. And it doesn't just break it in narrative terms, it breaks it in social and political terms as well, as we'll see. Okay, so going more directly into the kind of meat of the essay now, of William's essay, <clears throat> Film Bodies. So as alluded to earlier, it's a three genre investigation. Each of the three genres is, is what she calls a low body genre. Uh, all the numbers in brackets, obviously, from here on in until we stop talking about Williams, are references to the page number of Williams. Um, the low body genre is actually Carol Clover's term. I alluded to Carol Clover uh, in week six when we talked about Laura Mulvey, and you can find uh, last week, in fact, uh, and you can find um, you can find those slides about Carol Clover. Um, what this means is that they are genres that directly engage a bodily or emotional response. As opposed to, as I said earlier, the kind of mental and um, psychoanalytically kind of assumed mental responses of apparatus theory. These three genres are the genres firstly associated re with representations of women. Or they're three of the genres particularly associated with representations of women. And secondly, the ones accused of being excessive and gratuitous for Williams. Sex in the form of uh, the excess being sex in the form of pornography, violence with horror films, or emotion, an excess of emotion with melodrama, which has been dismissed as softcore emotional porn. These distinctions, however, are not always clear cut, as Williams is keen to point out. Williams starts um, across pages two and three by exploring the idea of gratuitousness, something which is gratuitous is also excessive, isn't it? It also goes beyond what is needed. You know, when something is gratuitous, it is more than what is needed. So that which is excessive in the genres. <clears throat> and this is inspired, and it's really interesting how she includes this, uh, includes this kind of story, kind of personal anecdote in terms of why she starts looking to this area. It's inspired by her seven-year-old son's response, responses to gross elements in films. So this, she's watched films with seven-year-olds and then things like kissing have come on. And the child has kind of turned away and gone, ugh, gross, you know, and started to label certain elements as gross. And it made her wonder why these were, these elements in particular, sort of seemed to push her son, you know, they sort of seemed to go beyond the pale for her son uh, with these films. So she started to think about kind of grossness and gratuitousness in a, in a, in a bigger picture way as applying um, across film genres that presumably her seven-year-old son was not enjoying at that point in his film watching career. So she starts to think about bad excess and how excess can be labelled, uh, has been labelled as such because the classical kind of story text is meant to have a certain kind of shallow psychological realism and kind of a narrative illusionism, it's meant to have balance, it's meant to be quite controlled and so on. So when texts have excesses that threaten that, they can be seen as bad. Or sort of behaving badly by kind of normative classical rules and that bad excess can be an excess of explicit sex or of violence or emotion importantly importantly williams points out that it's the excess that these elements represent that has led to the ideas about the genres becoming fixed and led to sort of certain value judgments about the genres becoming fixed they've become defined by how they're different from that reined in and balanced and very very controlled and calm classical realist narrative style so Sometimes the genres can kind of wear 
that situation or kind of turn that situation to their to their advantage. But certainly it's through excess, you know, for good or bad, it's through excess that they have become the ideas about them have become fixed with audiences. On this matter of the lack of aesthetic distance that Williams deals with on page five, that is traditionally seen uh, as associated with the female viewer of the so-called women's film, you know, particularly the melodrama as women's picture. It's not the case, she points out, it's not the case with more respected genres, with genres that are treated with more kind of critical acceptance, uh, more masculine genres, basically, that um, a model of viewer who is too involved and cannot attain a sort of critical distance from the events on the screen, so therefore too involved, too emotionally invested, takes things too, you know, takes things too much to heart or is kind of uh, maybe even lacks a sense of the 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 um, the fact that events on screen aren't real even. The, it's not the case with those other genres, like, for instance, westerns or crime films, detective films, film noirs. It's not the case that the viewer is seen as over-involved then, but it is the case that the viewer model used or often posited with melodramas is um, a female person. You know, the melodramas have more viewers than just women, but a female viewer who is seen as over-involved and over-invested and unable to achieve distance. Uh, because it isn't the case with other more respected, genre, more respected genres like westerns, then clearly we're looking at a double standard here. So this kind of over-investment and lack of, a, lack, lack of aesthetic dis, dis, sorry, lack of aesthetic distance, over-investment, over-emotional connection um, is seen in the low body genres as specifically a feminine matter and a matter of feminine loss of control. But of course, it's more complicated in reality, not only because not only women watch these films and consume these films, although they were the majority audience, certainly when these films were, were first getting distributed in the 1940s and 1950s, but of course, a male viewer is perfectly capable of crying at a film like this. If I was in the room with you watching Letter from an Unknown Woman, I would be quite moved. I am every time I see it, and it would be at least the ninth time I've seen that film. If I was in the if I was in the, a room with you all watching it, you know, I would be moved. I find it moving. I could cry. No problem. Um, I'm not sort of saying that to big up my to big up my kind of progressive credentials. It's just a fact that, you know, viewers can be moved by things. I don't think it is gendered in that way. But the way that responses are seen is gendered. The direct physical responses to all of the low body genres are seen as having a similar non-intellectual over-involvement in sensation, sensation rather than thought, basically sensation rather than thinking. So each of the body genres has its own kind of physical response. It's arousal, a kind of sexual sensation in the pornography film. It's violence or revulsion or jumping or you know whatever kind of revulsion or jumping, whatever reaction is garnered by the horror film. You know, sometimes people close themselves up, cover their eyes, sometimes they jump. A certain type of a certain type of scares and so on, um, or weeping at the melodrama. They are all seen as bypassing the intellect and going straight for the emotion and going straight for the feeling of sensation. Um, so this is the kind of overdetermined sort of double standard traditional view that a low body in low body genre in the form of melodrama allows. A feminine loss of control to play out and although that is part of the pleasure of the film it is something that can be criticized. Williams points out that in ecstatic experience the viewer loses themselves temporarily, becomes inarticulate, cries in pleasure, screams and sobs. I mean you'll remember that in previous classes we've talked about how all sorts of different types of films um, encourage a kind of losing oneself of the uh, of the spectators kind of you know, extra filmic or extra diegetic identity. I mean, that's part of identification, isn't it? But again, there seems to be a certain stressing on uh, how these kinds of activities are particularly associated with female viewers here. Now, I've left this slide in, even though it isn't so necessary because you're all going to watch the entire film. There's been a, a year when I've done this film and I had to kind of um, group some of the feminist films to do stuff into the same week as looking at gender and genre. And I wasn't able to screen the whole film, so I, sc I, I screened sort of selected chunks. But I've left this in because you might want to watch the film once all the way through. And then if you decide you've got interesting thoughts about the film or might want to visit it in um, in an essay, 
then uh, you know for a second viewing you might want to you might want to kind of jump straight to these chunks and concentrate so we've got sections where for instance the letter which is of the title you know the letter written by a woman who Stefan the pianist who is the uh, the, the male lead uh, receives right at the beginning of the film is introduced and that is the beginning of the disembodied narration of Lisa who is the female lead and the, the, the fact that that narration is disembodied is, a, is an important part of the film because she is the unknown woman but she's also the woman from the past so I'm trying to avoid spoilers here if I possibly can um, we have also their meeting here these timings are all from bots of broadcasts I think um, or they should be roughly approximate for bots broadcast. We have their meeting where Stefan says something like, I've seen you before. Um, well, I mean, I actually think they have seen each other before, but this is the first meeting where they speak. Uh, then we have other important um, sequences in the film, like the trip, the, the fair that they, they, they kind of um, develop their romantic relationship in, where they um, travel on this kind of fake train ride. Uh, and the train goes through all these kinds of monuments of kind of world, you know, sort of global travel, which is a really interesting image of uh, of sort of fakeness and artificiality and also stasis because they are sitting in a fake train carriage that isn't moving anywhere while a guy off, you know, sort of off uh, stage pedals a pedals a bike that kind of pulls this backdrop around and the backdrop changes outside the, the fake um, train carriage window. Um, and... Um, you know, Lisa and and Stefan's relationship gets deeper, but it gets much deeper for Lisa than it does for Stefan during that kind of sequence. Um, then there's another sequence where Stefan leaves and says, I'll be back in two weeks. He never comes back. And then there is Lisa in the hospital having his child um, a few weeks after that being kind of pressured by the nuns in the hospital, you know, if, you know, it'll be a lot easier for you. Life will be a lot easier for you if you tell us the name of the father. And, and she maintains this position of never wanting to ask Stefan for anything, never wanting to to sort of um, uh, be, you know, be any kind of burden for him. And so she she won't give up his name. This is important to the film as well. And then when they re-encounter each other 10 years later at the opera and he doesn't remember her, which is a kind of a crushing moment. And, and, and you know, if you're going to get moved by the film, it's one of those moments that you will probably find that you probably will find moving. It's a real crushing moment. So um, I've talked you through quite a lot of the film there. And, you know, you might not need to listen to this because you've, uh, you're you going to watch the film. But that's what this slide is about. If you do get get into Letter from an Unknown Woman, you can go back and revisit those uh, important sections. And I'm conscious of this becoming a super big file that will be difficult for me to upload to YouTube, but um, I am going to limit myself on this slide. But just to remind you that there is a discussion space for the film on Blackboard. So with me not being able to be there with you in the class this week, I still wanted people who wanted to discuss the film to have a, um, a platform to do it. So I set up a discussion space in Blackboard in the week seven area. It has some prompts at the top, some of which relate to the, the uh important sequences in the film I just talked about ideas of repetition ideas of stasis and and kind of you know artificiality so there are some prompts there so please have a look at those um it's not obligatory to carry on a conversation about the film but I think if you are not going to be together you can still share your thoughts about the film in that space and strangely enough I hadn't really thought about this last year when I first used or a couple years ago when I first used Portrait of Lady and Fire um in both this session and in the Laura Mulvey session although we didn't actually have time to look at the clip I intended to look at last week from Portrait of Lady on Fire if you do know the film you'll know the part I intended to use last week it's where they discuss the myth of Orpheus and Eurydi uh, uh, Eurydice I don't know how, now that I realize it I don't know how to pronounce that name uh, Eurydice perhaps um which is the myth of the uh, sort of adventuring man whose wife dies and then he sort of challenges the underworld to and he challenges a god of the underworld to rescue his wife from death and that is granted to him but he's told you have to lead her out of the underworld and if you look back at her before, before you get her into the light the light will bring her back to life but before you get her into the light before you leave the underworld before you leave hell essentially if you look back at her she will die forever and be lost and the women in Portrait of Lady Fire read this story together and they discuss and debate what it means that he does actually look round at the last minute. He can't resist to look round and look at his wife and that 
essentially kills her for all time. So people who know the film will know that scene. Other people can find that scene from the indications I put in the timing, the timings that I put in the slides last time. This is a different section of Portrait of a Lady on Fire, but to, to resume the point I started making at the start of this slide, um, I didn't intend this, but in Letter from an Unknown Woman, we have a meeting uh, uh, again at the opera 10 years later when Stefan does not remember Lisa, even though they've had this dalliance that was close enough and, and involved and, you know, involved sex enough, frankly, for them to uh, for her to conceive a child that um, we also have a reunion, a kind of reunion at an opera at the end of Portrait of a Lady on Fire. And these two characters. Uh, so you've got the character in the middle and on the right, who is um, Heloise, who is um, the kind of noble lady who's been. Uh, the subject of a painting by the character on the left, the first panel, who's the artist, and I've forgotten her the character's name, actually. Um, they have had a romance earlier on in the film, and then a number of years pass, and they see each other um, one more time. And this is also at the opera, so it's quite it's quite strange. They, they don't talk. Um, I'm pretty sure Heloise would recognise uh, her former lover, the artist, uh, so it wouldn't be quite like Letter from an Unknown Woman, but it is kind of odd that they both have these kind of um, not quite connecting reunions or operas scenes in them. Anyway, I include this clip from Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which you can access via the link. So you can just actually hover over the link in the slides and in this, uh, or not, not in YouTube, of course. So you'll have to go, but you'll have to open the slides on your computer and have them open simultaneously with this. Uh, and then you can go straight to the link by, like, by signing into Bots of Broadcasts. And you'll see essentially the last last scene of the film, and I include it because it it's it's at least a playing around with, if not a challenge, on the idea of a feminine, you know, marked as feminine lack of distance in consuming culture. Obviously, our example is films, but in the period in which Portrait of a Lady on Fire is set, it's pre-film. Uh, the experience, the intense artistic experience that Heloise actually has, is at the opera when she's listening to Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. This is a piece of music that has relevance to the plot. It has featured earlier in the film's plot. But what happens, as you'll see when you watch the clip, is that the artist takes her seat in this large theatre where The Four Seasons is going to be played by an orchestra, and she notices from right across the way, so there's a complete massive gulf separating them. All the stalls of the theatre are between them. They're both in the balcony, both in the, in the sort of circle. Um, so she can't reach out to Heloise, she can't speak to her either, but she's able to witness Heloise's response to hearing the music. And uh, her former lover, the artist, by the way, is also the narrator of the film. So Heloise is being observed without knowing it, and the artist is taking that what we might call more traditionally kind of positioned as masculine um, observing viewpoint, that kind of detached, controlling gaze viewpoint, where Heloise experiences the music and it eventually makes her cry uh, it moves her greatly and, cry, and makes her cry and then she laughs smiles and almost laughs with all the pleasure of it now um watching it will make a lot more sense than listening to me kind of describe it so i probably shouldn't have described it to such great length but please watch it and i think as well as trying to kind of make a um a case that this kind of idea of an intense pleasure at culture there's nothing wrong with it when something moves you there's nothing wrong with it it also puts an interesting spin on the idea of you know those kind of active and passive or sadistic and masochistic watching and being watched positions because apart from anything else you know here of course we've got two women so it's not a man and a woman it's not a man watching a, a sort of perfect woman um remotely you know while not while not being observed themselves so it's not a classic voyeur and exhibitionist thing uh, but also, but it is it is voyeuristic as well. So you might ask yourself after watching this, you know, what kind of voyeurism is this, and what makes it different from the kind of sort of more like obsessive, sexualized voyeurism that we discussed last week with Laura Mulvey. Anyway, I've gone on far too long on this slide. Please watch the clip and see what you think. Now let's get back more directly to Williams. Uh, Williams points points to how each of the three low body genres is associated with a different bodily fluid. It's easy to imagine which bodily fluid is at issue in. Uh, there's a table in a couple of slides time anyway, but um, which bodily fluid is associated with pornography? It's easy to, to guess. And with melodrama, of course, with the crying that goes on or is supposed to go on, we, um, you know, we realise that the bodily fluid in question is tears. I guess with horror, the bodily fluid that is associated with violence and um, 
uh, you know, kind of um, the, the hurting and maiming and killing of bodies is going to be blood. The, the bodily fluids don't have to be released by the audience, uh, just to be clear, but they may be released by the audience. The horror film audience does not have to release blood or, or lose any blood. Um, it's more that the association of um, of that genre with that particular bodily fluid. But she argues that the genre should be understood in terms of perversion. She draws on um, Freud's kind of psychoanalytic handling of ideas of perversion, which were not exactly normal, but they were not, you know, one of the things that Freud did do was by, by clinically approaching these things, he sort of tried to demystify some of the moralism around perversion. So a moralistic approach to perversion would be to call somebody a pervert and say there was something wrong with them. And that wasn't really the Freudian approach. So the psychoanalytic way of describing a perversion is not moralistic. Um, and Williams argues the genre should be understood in terms of perversion, but that the genres are not, um, or, or the perversion that the genres excite, if you like, or stimulate, are not patriarchally controlled. So therefore, they are not necessarily supporting the normative system anyway. So even though a sexual perversion and a particular way of being sexually gratified by looking at women might well be a part of the, por the pornography experience, and, and, and you know, quite obviously it is, um, it isn't necessarily normatively controlled within patriarchy in the way that you might think and is therefore not necessarily worthy of condemnation. You know, Williams is trying to keep an open mind again about these genres, as I've said quite a few times already. Um, the fact that the other genres are more patriarchally controlled, and this can be seen in their style, their lack of excess, for instance, um, is a kind of political failing, if you like, of those genres. Or, or Williams, can, you know, Williams would argue, could be seen as a political failing of those genres. Whereas these genres, although they have a terrible low reputation, um, cannot be controlled by the patriarchy and therefore don't support the normative system as much as the other genres. Now, returning to Mulvey for a moment, as I said, we can see Williams uh, writing quite a long time after Mulvey as uh, a revision of certain aspects of Mulvey, if not a direct kind of refutation, but a revision. Mulvey had established an idea of sadism. We discussed this briefly in the class last week linking it to how a masculine narrative logic is imposed on a female image and the, the control and sometimes the punishment of um, of the feminine the, the, and the female that kind of results from that. Uh, you know, you'll remember she, she connected sadism to, to the idea of narrative as well. But following Mulvey, much feminist analysis of genres like horror had cast female characters in along, along these same sort of lines as victims of sadism with the male as the source of that, whether in the text, so characters in the text, or kind of culturally in the sort of sense of the audience wanting to see, you know, the kind of what used to be thought of as the majority male audience of horror, although I'm not sure that holds up these days. And industrial as well, of course, you know, as we discussed last last week, you know, the people at the top of film studios, uh, uh, those boardrooms are, are full of men. So much feminist analysis had cast female characters as victims of sadism. However, Williams, and she is following on from work from Clover. Clover's work comes out a little bit after um, in, put in date terms for the editions I've used comes out a little bit later than Williams, but these ideas, she'd already started to publish that, these ideas in journals. Williams following Clover argues that the genre presents an oscillation between masochistic and sadistic positions. <clears throat> that is the horror genre presents a movement, you know, a kind of um, moving between and kind of alternating between masochistic and sadistic positions. And in last week's slides, we didn't get quite get time to cover this in the in the workshop because we were having such a productive time on Mulvey. But last week's slides, if you look back at them, they contain a look at Carol Clover and her reading of Horror's female survivor or the, the well-known figure of the final girl. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this in class as well last week when we talked about the example of Ripley, who can be seen as final girl of Alien. And the final girl goes from victimization. She's victimized all the way through the narrative until her resourcefulness and whatever special abilities that she has enable her to become the survivor so she goes from victimization to empowerment and we discussed that a little last week but it's also in those slides so we see this in kind of films like halloween and alien texas chainsaw massacre and so on so following on from the last slide it's the idea that sadism can be present plus masochism at the same time this is kind of what williams is tapping into the same spectator can feel 
both of those things simultaneously or at different times during the film and via different identifications. The spectator doesn't always have to identify with the victim and the spectator doesn't always have to identify with the monster. You know, it doesn't have to always be the, the sadistic position and doesn't always have to be the masochistic position. I think I alluded to on the last slide as well about um, the gendering of audiences of horror films these days being different than the, than the expectation used to be. And the beauty of recording a session instead of doing it live is that I can look something up in between uh, uh, slides that I'm recording and then add something. So I looked up uh, just very, very quickly, looked up some demography uh, of recent horror hits and I found something about uh, The Exorcist Believer, which references The Exorcist Believer's opening weekend being expected to be very evenly split between males and female, male and female audience in America, about 50-50. And it references in the little inset box you can see there that with the non-two, female audience is actually dominated at 52%. So there, there used to be an assumption that, that horror film consumption was such a male activity that clearly everything happening in the films had to be kind of um, orientated towards uh, a male gaze. Uh, and, and movie was assuming this in 1975, but it's already started to change um, in terms of the theoretical understanding of horror by 1991 and Williams's piece. And we can sort of see that the demographics also bear that out these days. It's much more equal, if not if not female dominated at times. Anyway, um, the point is there is always power. There's always power and always pleasure for a female viewer, even in this most unlikely of genres, uh, and even when even when women are disproportionately the victims and the masochists in the film texts in the fiction. Um, Williams is talking about spectators' experiences you know, not purely what characters are subjected to uh, is another thing to remember. So in all these genres, um, William sees this kind of twofold um, gendered, what she calls bisexual, but not really meaning bisexual in the sense of a person who's attracted to two genders, but sort of um, plural, you know, a plural sexual model of identification at work. She argues that even in the most extreme displays of feminine masochistic suffering, there is always a component of either power or pleasure for the woman victim. Uh, and all of this leads her on, to, leads Williams on to the construction of an anatomy of film bodies, which is the table here on the right. A table of qualities that list the individual uh, qualities of the three body genres that she's looked at and sort of implicitly compare them to, um, to the norms of Hollywood. Um, and you can spend some time looking at that yourself. Obviously, you should have looked at it already in the, in the form of the essay. So all the three, um, all the three genres are, con are considered there. I would sort of point out, you, you'll see at the top, you've got the category of bodily excess. And we talked about um, each, um, each genre is sort of uh, said by Williams to, to, to sort of release or involve a different bodily fluid. They all have a different kind of perversion. Um, associated with them they all have a different temporality which will be interesting for you when you come to watch the melodrama later letter from an unknown woman she said the temporality of melodrama is too late um and this is different from horror where it's too early you know there wasn't enough time for the person to be saved in in, in melodrama is different the the um the moment has already passed the moment when things could have could have taken a better turn has already passed and she also mentioned some important films in both, um, in, sorry, in all three of the genres. Um, and she also mentions the presumed audience. And you can see there with horror, the presumed audience back in 1991, even still then, was adolescent boys um, and not a presumption of uh, a strong female audience, which is actually what we find now in theatrical um, reports of and data of who's actually going to consume horror films. So I'll spend a little time looking at that table. And of course, when thinking of this with horror, it reminds us that there may be uh, a kind of official way that things are meant to be consumed. There may even be an ideal spectator. There may be an ideal way of consuming a film, and that might be for uh, a kind of sadistic and active male audience and, and disadvantaging a, a, a supposedly passive female audience. But films are not always, you know, you know, spectators aren't ideal, number one, so spectators are not like that. They're real people who watch things in ways that suit them and they read against the grain, as we've discussed in previous weeks quite often. Um, 
and the ideal way of reading films is quite often ignored or, or doesn't exist at all. Uh, it's important to remember that as well when, when thinking of how spectators can possibly be empowered by um, films and genres that may seem to be ideologically dubious for them. So Williams concludes that these body genres are less, and you know, we've been kind of on, on our way to this conclusion for the last couple of slides, but these body genres are, are in fact less monolithically misogynist than they have been considered by some feminist critics. And if you're a horror fan and a woman and have sometimes maybe felt, you know, been curious about why that is, um, because of the violence to women that horror sort of traditionally seems to represent, um, I think Linda Williams' essay can be quite helpful to you because it does try to open up something a little bit more complicated than the than the um, than the, if you like the sort of the first the first wave of film studies fem of feminist film theories in the 1970s, um, which tended to dismiss to, to dismiss the horror because of its violence against women. Um, and sort of dismiss it because of its ide ideological sort of posturing, that Linda Williams' essay can be quite useful to explore how positions, you know, identifications and positions are actually much more complicated than that. So she argues the genres, all of those three genres, are less monolithically misogynist, not just horror, than they have been considered. And she says, one thing already seems clear, these gross body genres, which may seem so violent and inimical, eh, inimical uh, you know, in other words, incompatible with uh, women, cannot be dismissed as evidence of a monolithic and unchanging misogyny as either pure sadism for male viewers or as masochism for females. They can't be seen as in terms of that binary of, you know, male sadism and female masochism. She disputes that. Their very existence, the horror, the, the genres, the three genres, their very existence and popularity hinges upon rapid changes taking place in relations between the sexes and by rapidly changing notions of gender. To dismiss them, the genres, as bad excess, whether of explicit sex, violence or emotion, is not to address their function as cultural problem solving. And of course, just to remind you that we've been talking about horror a lot in the last few slides as the example, but our example today is, of course, melodrama, where the the excess is in terms of motion, the excess is in terms of a, um, a, a pr proposed female viewer not being able to control her emotion, not being able to remain critically distanced when regarding the film, and that there is somehow a sort of loose, feminine, hysteric, almost kind of outpouring of emotion at the melodrama that is has been seen as a bad excess before um, before the, this revision of Williams. So she would also not want to, not want the melodrama to, to be dismissed as bad excess. And this takes us back to her. This takes me back to her overall aims for the essay and her objectives, which is to challenge the idea of excess as bad. Um, you know, the, the, to to argue that that which seems to destabilize traditional narrative realism or destabilize, you know, the idea of the classical is necessarily bad filmmaking or even bad ideology. She wants to explore that and she wants to challenge that idea that excess must be bad. These genres, these genres, remember, are low. They're called low genres. They're low. They're classed as low culturally. So she tries to find the more complicated way that they may exist as problem solvers. You know, that's there in the last sentence, isn't it? To dismiss them as bad excess is not to address their function as cultural problem solving. And uh, the cat has just jumped up on to my lap for this slide. So if you hear any purring, that probably means he's got close to the computer. Um, so continuing Williams' conclusions, the body genres, she says, are dependent on fluid notions of gender and sexuality and what it means to be a man or a woman. Now, I'll point out again, I think I said earlier, but I'll point out again, Williams is writing in 1991. She isn't trying to rule out or leave out any points on a, on a spectrum of gender. Um, we have, oh, there, there, there we go, the cat's left now. Um, we obviously have more gender identities available and we see more gender identities and we are more gender, gender identities as people now than in 1991 or at least that were, that were recognised in 1991 and I'm sure the language of the essay would be slightly different um, today if she were to write it today. Uh, the language that is used is I suppose talking about the notional the notional identities that the, that the films make available I think rather than ruling any any other kind of identity out. Um, so the body genres are dependent on fluid notions of gender and sexuality. The visceral mimicry, the fact that the, the fact that watching the genres uh, induces some kind of uh, imitation in our bodies 
of what we see on screen. Particularly, it's particularly easy to see this in melodrama, isn't it, in terms of tears. Um, the visceral mimicry elicited by the body genres is also not a mere imitation, but a kind of gendered cultural mediation. Uh, it's it's a cultural mediation. It's something that allows people, you know, problem solving was worked out on another uh, was uh, problem solving was mentioned in another quotation, wasn't it? Uh, it's a process that people go through that can actually be quite helpful to them in their social lives. It's a kind of gendered cultural mediation that may not be purely abject or negative. You know, remember that something that mediates comes between us and something else. You know, in this case, comes between us and something that's scary or worrying or a problem. And spectators gain pleasure from lots of things and positions. Sometimes these things are sadistic and sometimes they are masochistic. Again, as with Nick Brown, uh, albeit in a, maybe a more subtle way in Nick Brown, we're moving away from an idea of a single spectator who is fixed into position and can only take away one kind of meaning. And we're moving towards a spectator who can be present in lots of different moments in the text and lots of different experiences and can actually handle and hold those experiences together, even if they appear to be in conflict with each other. So spectators can sometimes feel sadistic along with the film. Sometimes they can feel masochistic. We need not equate sadistic, she says, with male or masculine and masochistic with female. This relates back to what Anne Kaplan said. Um, and this is in last week's slides, so the, the part just after we finished uh, the Mulvey workshop, which we didn't quite get to, but um, I think I ran through very quickly. Anne Kaplan says about the male gaze regime involves a power, a power binary. It's a dominant and submissive power binary and not just a purely gendered one. It's not just man stroke woman, it's dominant stroke submissive. So Williams says, in, you know, films will always feature certain statistics qualities and will always feature certain masochistic qualities that isn't the same as saying the sadistic qualities are always aligned and identified with males and the masochistic ones with women and now something uh different i'd mentioned that you could also do in your preparatory reading you could also do the reading by steve neal masculinity is spectacle which actually comes out eight years before linda williams um piece but still eight years after Laura Mulvey's original piece. So we can group these two together as both concerned with gender and genre, and they're both fair game for you to write about in terms of the essay question on gender and genre. Um, although I think you have to only write about one. Uh, if you read the brief carefully, I think you're only allowed to write about one of those essays at a time. Um, but you can group both of these pieces together as kind of responses to Mulvey, if not critiques, but responses. This one is perhaps more of a, a, a critique um, than Williams is, uh, uh, Williams is, is later. Uh, so Steve Neal, so we'll run through this for the next few slides and then the, uh, the lecture will be over and you'll be able to watch the film and obviously then share your thoughts about the film and the Blackboard discussion. So part of the way that genre constructs a viewing experience in conjunction with the spectator is through gender address. Steve Neal combined his approach to genre as a process, which hopefully you'll remember, uh, you know, draws on uh, psychoanalytic ideas and certainly kind of psychoanalytic and semiotic kind of inspired models of, models of identification because that's the first the first time we talked about things like lack and the Oedipus complex and uh, kind of psychoanalytic identities was uh, and identifications was when we looked at genre last uh, last trimester with Steve Neal. So Steve Neal combined his approach to genre as a process with a sustained look at the representation of masculinity in Masculinity as Spectacle, first published in Screen in 1983, uh, where, which is also the place where both Williams and Mulvey's uh, original articles were published for the first time as well. Like Williams, his essay is a response to, but also draws heavily on visual pleasure and narrative cinema. And there is a, uh, an extract there for you to watch. You can either watch it now, the link, I'm gonna uh, try to remember to put all the links in, um, in the actual, uh, notes for the YouTube link that you're watching now, but you will also be able to access that clip through uh, the, the slides when you just download the slides. So you can either watch that now or come to it in a couple of slides time and it might be a little bit more relevant. Neil's essay is an investigation of how the male body is presented and received in male action genres, uh, especially the Western, although he just touched on other genres and you can see that the essay was republished as where I read it for the first time in the early 90s, was republished in a collection, one of the earliest collections really that I have found exploring masculinity in Hollywood cinema, as you can see there from the sub subtitle on the book is called Screening the Male, uh, edited by Cohan and Hark. Uh, so Neil proposes that male action genres, quote, privilege, examine and celebrate the body of the male. And right away you might be thinking, well, isn't the male supposed to be 
the viewer and the voyeur, not the exhibitionist? Why would the body of the male be celebrated? And that's something that Mulvey doesn't cover, of course. Steve Neal is saying, well, it depends on the genre that you're watching. In some genres, um, maybe the male is for both of those things, for being the, vo the voyeur voyeuristic, sadistic, kind of punishing sort of uh, investigator figure who knows all the answers and makes sense of everything. And in other genres, or perhaps in other parts of the film from the same genre, their body is on display and they're more exhibitionist. So Neil considers the representation of the male body in terms of identification. For example, a spectator imagining themselves in the hero role. We spoke about this with Laura Mulvey in the workshop last week, didn't we? Because she takes the uh, psychoanalytic Freudian, or, or at least psychoanalytic, I think it's, it's, it may be Lacan's term, uh, ego ideal. So a spectator imagining themselves in the role of the hero. In terms of looking, he explores looking, voyeurist, voyeuristic and fetishistic looking. And, you know, I've already mentioned the Western on this slide, but you probably know yourselves how important gazes are to Westerns. And spectacle, uh, the display that stops narrative. Again, something that is only really supposed to be associated with the objectified and sexualized female, as we have discussed in past weeks, um, in relation to the, the extract from Desperado. So Steve Neal links these to the way the film asks the spectator to assume certain positions related to power and sexuality, reinforcing the idea that genres organise and offer social positions to be taken up by spectators, which is very consistent with what he wrote about in his book Genre in 1980, which is the parts of Steve Neal um, that you've discussed with me before were, were, draw, were drawing on genre for the uh, genre lectures last year. So some of those social positions that genres help to offer are gendered ones. From Mulvey's work, Neil accepts that narrative cinema is structured around the male look, but questions whether this male look must necessarily be the sadistic, possessive gaze of a male spectator at the female star object. Uh, star or object. It's become the norm to understand images that display male power in the Western, for instance, to promote a form of self-affirming identification with a powerful and capable hero. And, and indeed, we, we have looked at that over the past couple of weeks. Here's a quote from Neil. Narcissism and narcissistic identification both involve fantasies of power, omnip omnipotence, mastery and control. And then he talks about the Sergio Leone's Dollar Trilogy of Westerns starring Clint Eastwood and the clip from the last slide is from the Dollar Trilogy. So now might be a good time to watch it. Um, the Leone Trilogy is marked by the extent to which the hero's powers are rendered almost godlike. But when you watch that extract, which is a very brief one of about a couple of minutes, you'll notice that that is a section of the film where Eastwood's hero, you know, the man with no name as he became known, um, is not at all godlike. So Neil wonders if there may be an element of masochism in this. Male action genres tend to feature scenes where the male body is punished, abused and mutilated. And this seems to have fallen outside of being noticed by Mulvey, who has tended to, you know, to focus on in her paper, tended to focus on the punishment of the female through, you know, the the various kind of um, uh, routes that help sort of soothe castration anxiety in the male spectator. So the concentration was on female punishment, not on male punishment. On page 13, Steve Neal then cites David Roderick, who says, quote, so this is Roderick, Mulvey discusses the male star as object of the look, but denies him the function of an erotic object. Because, sorry, I'll, I'll change the emphasis there. Mulvey discusses the male star as object of the look, but denies him the function of an erotic object. Because Mulvey conceives the look to be essentially active in its aims, identification with the male protagonist is only considered from a point of view which associates it with a sense of assuming control of the narrative. She makes no differentiation between identification and object choice in which sexual aims may be directed towards the male figure. So this seems to be some kind of blind spot that uh, Neil and Roderick are talking about in Mulvey. So as a quick look at this slide will tell you, we've got some famous films on there. We do actually see these scenes of the male lead and male action star being punished and beaten okay they may eventually prevail in the film at the end but no matter how skilled they are no matter how prepared they are and how in control they are they undergo these kinds of punishment scenes these scenes of torture these scenes of beating it's not always a sadistic dishing out of, of the beating uh, think about the lingering beating given to john rambo played by stallone in rambo 2 for instance rambo 2 is the one where he 
preposterously um, is sent on a mission to Vietnam, to, to the jungles in Vietnam, to recover American prisoners of war who are still who's still there 10, 10 years later. I mean, it's a preposterous film, but it's, it's, an, it's you know, I find it quite enjoyable, I must admit. Um, but he's beaten, he's electrocuted, his body, Stallone's body, which is as you know, bigger than it has ever been before, even bigger than it was in Rocky, I think, uh, is, is kind of put on display for long lingering shots. The same happens in a way. Uh, there's an interesting um, variation on this with um, Daniel Craig in uh, Casino Royale, and I've put a link to this in the notes for this YouTube video. Um, the variation is that, you know, Bond is stripped naked and then has his genitals attacked, basically, in this beating. But he kind of keeps making jokes all the way throughout. And that's kind of part of the Bond character kind of set of qualities, isn't it? But it still kind of fits into this same kind of scene. And you can even think of, of Han Solo, you know, talking about pain being visited upon the being visited upon the male action star. OK, Han Solo, when he's frozen in carbonite, is is asleep, really. He's not really meant to be feeling pain, but he's literally frozen in a pain pose, isn't he? When he drops into that kind of chamber and is frozen in carbonite in Empire Strikes Back 1980. And both Rambo 2 and Empire Strikes Back, by the way, can be seen as kinds of Western, um, which accords very well with what Steve Neal has been talking about, uh, primarily referencing Westerns in that article. So Neal says, quote, male genres and films constantly involve sadomasochistic themes, scenes and fantasies, where male heroes are marked as the object of an erotic gaze. The putting the body of display, even with Daniel Craig example, which is a little different, the putting on the body of display is really important here. It's the male body, it's on display. As the quote said earlier, it can be celebrated, but also it can be enjoyed. But we may ask ourselves, why can't it simply be enjoyed as a beautiful body? Why can't the male body just be enjoyed um, and shown as a sexual, as a sexual thing, as a sexual pleasure? Why does the beating then have to take place? Well, treating the male body like this functions to, to mark that body in terms of pain rather than beauty, this is what Neil argues. Thus, it represses or disavows, to use a more psychoanalytically appropriate term, it disavows the potentially troubling homosexual feelings of implied straight male spectators, as Neil says. <coughs> Quote, the male body cannot be marked explicitly as the erotic object of another male look. You can't offer the male body, even in one of these action genres you can't offer the male body as something there to be appreciated as beauty by the male spectator the film kind of wants to do that but it has to channel that energy somewhere else so that look uh, i'm adding to the quote there obviously the male body can't be marked explicitly as the erotic object of another male look that look must be motivated in some other way it's erotic component repressed so that's the channeling away that i'm talking about potentially troubling a potentially troubling feeling arising in male spectators Assuming a normative view, of course, of sexuality upheld by mainstream cinema and assuming that the um, core audience for a male action genre film would be a straight man. And again, we don't know that, do we? We don't know that for sure. And it certainly will be less the case these days than it would have been when Neil was writing in 1983. However, his main point is that you, you can have both of those things. You can have the male body be naked and be on display and be celebrated. But quite quickly after that, you have to have the scene of pain to follow, to channel away and redirect that erotic energy. Obviously, Neil is here referring to Mulvey, who says the normative gender system of mainstream cinema relies on a male look. So a genre um, like, you know, a spy film, for instance, or like a Western, you know, got two types of Westerns here, a genre that relies on looking at the male body in a variety of contexts has found strategies to enable it to channel eroticism out of the equation. So it's kind of having its cake and eating it in a way. So one of the things that Neil is trying to do in relation to Mulvey is he's trying to say that all of the things that Mulvey attributes, at least in classical story cinema, to only the presentation of the woman, you know, the sexual objectification, the uh, association with spectacle rather than narrative. Neil is, is saying in certain genres, you can find this true to be true of the male uh, and of the male character. Neil goes on to talk about the contradictions inherent to a genre created around the premise of looking at the male hero, he means the Western here, where set pieces exist so that the male body can be put on display. Quote, when a narrative outcome is determined through a fight or gun battle, male struggle becomes pure spectacle. Now, it's not only Westerns where um, big um, sort of one on one on one confrontations are the main spectacle of the films, are they? That's kind of true of almost any um, spectacular action movie in any kind of sort of subgenre or franchise 
these days. It's that kind of uh, may not have the quite the emphasis on the gays that Western standoffs do. Um, but that's quite true, isn't it? That's quite true throughout the male action genres. So male struggle becomes pure spectacle. This means narrative is held up while the body is put on display. You may remember this is what we've talked about uh, with, with Mulvey, again, in regards to that clip from Desperado. Think about the emphasis as well on looks and eyes in those gun standoffs in Westerns. You know, there's one at the end of The Good, The Bad and the Ugly, at the end of the Leone trilogy, a big famous one in The Good, The Bad and the Ugly. There's famous ones in films like Reservoir Dogs, of course, as well. And think about martial, martial arts battles as well. You know, whenever an advert or some TV show is kind of parodying a martial, art, a martial arts battle, they always include those kind of close, tight uh, shots around the eyes, don't they, to sort of show the, the the violent intent of the protagonists. It's 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 about it's about looking, looking and kind of almost like weaponizing looking again. Steve Neal also notes that refusal of marriage is often a feature of the Western. The bigger role for women in later Westerns threatens the narcissistic impulse of the male, so they leave society to preserve their phallic independence, even if it's made clear to them and to the audience that the woman is in love with them. So it doesn't happen in stagecoach, of course, interestingly, because they manage to work work out a way where um, Ringo and Dallas can be, you know, saved from the blessings of civilization, as as um, as the doc puts it, and they go off together. But in many westerns, um, from a little bit later, from the other fifties onwards, uh, and, and there's three very very famous examples there: Shane, The Searchers, and Once Upon a Time in the West. The protagonist is either injured at the end, so he can't be with the woman, um, or the or the woman is is unavailable but loves him as in the case of Shane. She's married but she loves him. In the searchers he can't even return to to the home where the woman he loves was killed, sort of instigating the revenge cycle of the film. But he can't even return into the home, into the domestic setting, you know, because it implies that he would be domesticated and maybe would meet another woman and marry her in the future. So he again he walks away, the door closes, literally closes on John Wayne's character in the searchers and he's never seen again by the audience at least. And uh, the same happens with Charles Bronson's character Harmonica in Once Upon a Time in the West. So, you know, this makes us, this seems a little bit fishy as well, doesn't it? You know, why is the male hero always refusing to be married, even though clearly he loves and there is a woman that loves him too? What I mean by something that's a bit fishy is kind of, we need to ask ourselves, what does this then mean for the, for the female characters, that the, that the men reject them in this way? But think of the fates of many female characters in action films. So in Rambo, um, in the second Rambo film, and in the, in the second Lethal Weapon film, actually, a character played by Patsy Kensett, um, uh, you know, potential uh, romantic romantic partners that the, that the heroes do have a, a serious connection with, physical and romantic, certainly romantic connection, uh, they are, they're killed and they become part of the, again, the motivation cycle for the character. So those women aren't seen as very important in the first place, which is very much in keeping with the Western tradition. It's really interesting to look at Bond in this respect. So so all of the Bond continuity from 2006 Casino Royale to the end, uh, you know, it, it's kind of implied as the end of that body of continuity, isn't it? With no time to die in 2021. All of that spins out of Bond's experience of betrayal by a woman and then her death. And that's Vesper Lynn, the Eve Green character you can see on the right there. And if you remember, and actually it's a while since I wrote, first wrote these slides, so it's actually now been quite a while since I saw Casino Royale. But I think it's when Bond is talking to Q, you know, Judy Dench, Judy, uh, sorry, M, Judy Dench is M. And Judy Dench asks about the Vesper Lynn character, who's, you know, an antagonist, even though she has um, had this this romantic relationship with Bond, she, she was, you know, she was not on his side. Um, she was kind of playing playing both sides and M asks about about Vesper Lind right at the end of the film and Bond has just seen her die drown and uh, very callously Bond says the bitch is dead and we don't really quite believe it and I think it's meant to be seen and is played by Daniel Craig as him trying to sound tough and this is maybe not his true feelings but irrespective of that you know that creates the Bond character right there in that kind of in that scene in Italy and it creates the Bond character for the next 15 years um, and I think it's really interesting that he has to he has to front up as so misogynist he has to front up as such a misogynist especially to M who's a woman um, for the film to kind of make sense and for the following you know three or four films and that and that continuity of 15 years to make sense of course people who've seen No Time to Die will know that there are developments of the Bond character by the time that film comes around I won't get into that in case it's a spoiler for people uh, so while Mulvey states that narrative cinema is organised around the spectacular display of the woman, 
Steve Neal's work points out that these genres privilege, examine and celebrate the male body. <clears throat> this also relates to Williams in that Neal proposes a kind of male version of the low body genre, possessing some of the facets of quote, bodily hysteria and excess of the melodrama. Again, I would refer you to the, the kind of torture and electrocu electrocution scene um, in Rambo 2, if you want to see something that's both excessive and kind of hysterical. And one final thought about masculinity and uh, Westerns before we wrap up and before you go off to watch A Letter from an Unknown Woman, which is, is not this type of film, although it does have there's, you know, you can certainly study it in terms of the masculinity of the, the male lead, Stefan, and the, the kind of honourable, unshowy masculinity of the, the romantic rival um, for Stefan, who is the woman that, that Lisa, uh, uh, the man, sorry, that Lisa eventually marries. But just one thought, um, Steve Neal is influenced by writings such as Robert Warshaw's on the Westerner, on the Western character. His, his essay, Robert Warshaw's famous essay from the 50s was called The Westerner, but you'll see it also titled as Movie Chronicle, colon, The Westerner, to reflect the name of the publication it was first in. And Warshow is a really interesting article. I don't really have time to sort of go into it, but you'll be able to find it if you're interested in the Western, and I do recommend it. But he concentrates on the honourable, self-possessed Westerner, that in control, not necessarily the sadistic West, not necessarily the sadistic male action lead, but the honourable and very much in control um, figure of the Westerner, of the cowboy, of the gunfighter. Um, but we find divergences and exceptions to this, you know, the, you know, just as Steve Neal is saying that there is there are exceptions to the male body and the way it's it's usually used uh, as seen by Mulvey as this vessel purely of control and of voyeuristic looking at women, voyeuristic objectification and punishment of women. Just as that's an exception, we find exceptions to the character types of Westerns, uh, Westerners as well. So the last time I watched The Magnificent Seven from 1960, which is a film that is already 60 years old, so it's not it's not as if this is a kind of this fits into the what we'd call the kind of re revisionist western period when attitudes were changing um charles bronson plays a character called o'reilly and he really flips the message of that honorable self-possessed westerner so in the, in the final 10 minutes of the film i've not been able to find this clip but i've given you an alternative clip um from youtube in the in the notes um that you could look at that kind of gives you a sense of his character but it isn't it isn't this scene that i'm talking about now it does give you a sense of his character though in the final 10 minutes of the film, O'Reilly tells the, the, these small boys that have been following following him around ever since he was introduced into the narrative. They admire him. They admire his skills. They think he's a tough guy. They think he's great with the gun. They want to copy him. They want to be like him. They see him as the way to grow up, basically. He tells these small acolytes, look at your fathers, who are the simple vi the farmers in the village. And he says, you know, if you want to know courage, look at your fathers. And he tries to put them off being like him. He says... You know, he essentially says, don't be like me, look at your fathers for a model. And a lot of regret is displayed by the fighters in the Magnificent Seven, that they cannot have homes and families, etc. Which is interesting, given what I talked about with the searchers and with the characters played by Wayne, Ethan Edwards, in the searchers before. I mean, he regrets, clearly, but he, he won't say it. You know, he won't say it. He just turns and the door closes behind him. The famous last shot of the searchers is a door closing literally on Ethan Edwards. Whereas in the Magnificent Seven, several characters point out, you know, they can't have families, they can't have homes, they may as well help the village fight, even if it means their deaths, because they, you know, they they can't have that kind of life. But importantly, they actually show that they regret that. And O'Reilly is a really interesting character to look at, I think. However, this lecture is not really about the Western. Um, it's about the melodrama and uh, the set film is the melodrama Letter from an Unknown Woman. So after a few brief comments on the next two slides, I want you to go and watch that as well as watch the clips throughout this slide, throughout this presentation if you haven't watched them yet. Okay, so the next two slides are simply prompts um, for you to think about when you are watching Letter from an Unknown Woman and for you to uh, order your thoughts after you've seen the film to kind of see how you feel about it. The same prompts are also in the discussion place on Blackboard. It's based on Blackboard. So if you do have thoughts about the film, and, and I'd love it if you would contribute them to the discussion space, I'll pop on pop onto there later this week and um, answer any questions or put any points up that I think um, spin out of your comments. Um, I'm not going to go through these prompts now on the narration. I'm just going to show them to you and you can also find them in the discussion space, as I've said. But of course, anything that you find, anything that you find yourself feeling in relation to um, the melodrama letter from an unknown woman is would be great to hear from you about on Blackboard in that discussion space, including if it made you feel sad 
and how that how that manifested. So here are today's references. Some of the references from the early recap on feminism may not be here. They will be in the slides. Uh, they'll be in the reference slides and bibliographies from weeks five and six. So you may have to root around in the previous week's slides to find people I refer to in those first um, three slides today. Uh, you'll notice that I've grouped these together. Essays that relate to or in some way continue the argument or even comment on Linda Williams on one side, and essays that relate to comments on continuing the argument, etc., of Steve Neal on the other. I've also included Mulvey, but that's kind of obvious. You've all got Mulvey now. And I was just searching around for Robert Walsh Show's piece on the Westerner, about which I've just been talking to you, um, and realised that it's actually in Film Theory and Criticism, a book which I know many of you have had in your hands or may even have a copy of. So it's actually just a couple of essays before Linda Williams' um, essay, Film Bodies, in the sixth edition, anyway, from 2004. Um, so quite easy to find that one. Just go and find a, a, a especially an older edition of Film Theory and Criticism in the library. Uh, we should have quite a few if you want to read about Robert Warshow. Um, and that's it really for this week. One more thing to say on the next slide. It's tutorials next week, not a full lecture, as you should be prepared for, because it's been that way all through the um, all through the trimester. That's been the plan. So it's individual tutorials. There are quite a lot of you for me to try and do in four hours. Um, I'm not really into only giving people 10 minutes, but I might have to kind of, I might have to kind of um, set you up as 10 minute, 10 minute tutorials, but I'll do sort of five, five in an hour. So it'll actually be more like 12, it'll actually be more like 12 minutes. So I'll put all the details for that up on the Blackboard page. I'll send an announcement out when it's ready. Only a couple of people have come back to me about wanting to um, be seen at a specific time of day or not wanting to come into the building because it's a long way to come for sort of 10 to 15 minutes, which I do understand. I'd prefer to see people in the room, in the normal classroom, or I might hold some of them just in gen generally on the third floor. You just have to look for me on the third floor after 1 p.m. on that on that Monday, which is um, 4th of March. Um, but all those details will be in the um, in the message on Blackboard. If you really, really have to swap your time slot, I'd prefer it if you didn't. But if you really have to swap your time slot, please email me in advance, not on the Monday morning, but please email me in advance so that I can arrange that. Um, if you don't swap it before the Monday morning and you come, you know, when it's time for somebody else's, you're just going to have to wait until the next opportunity. Um, but that will all be sorted out and fed through to you via Blackboard. Uh, hope you have a good week. Thank you for bearing with this lecture. There's lots more work to do for you to do in terms of watching the film, watching the extracts, um, maybe going through the slides one more time and certainly reading Linda Williams if you have not done so already. Cheers. See you next time.